Well, good afternoon, everybody from London. I'm Brian Burridge. I'm the Chief Executive of the Royal Aeronautical Society, and you're very welcome to this webinar, as are the team from Roland Berger, who are with us, um, and I'll introduce them shortly. Uh, first, let me just outline the schedule of events. We'll um, have the presentation, and then uh, we'll follow that with a Q&A, aiming to finish by 1700 UK time. So let me introduce the panel. To start with Manfred Harder, with a background in high-tech industries, Manfred is a senior partner of Roland Berger and has been with the firm since 1998. He currently serves as co-head of their global aerospace and defense practice and is the managing partner of the Hamburg office. Next, Robert Thompson is a partner and uh, in the London office, he's an expert in aerospace and defense aviation sectors. He focuses on, on strategy, mergers and acquisitions and operational performance improvement. And in his work on sustainability, he's the author of several publications on electrical publication, uh, sorry, electrical propulsion, hydrogen power and sustainable aviation fuels, which is about to hit the streets. And finally, Nikhil Sakdeva. Nikhil is a project manager and is thought leader on sustainable aviation. He leads the company's work into how the aviation sector can transform itself and transition to a more climate friendly um, tech or use climate, more climate friendly technologies from anything from electrical propulsion through hydrogen and synthetic aviation fuels as well as specializing in commercial and technological implications of all that to the aerospace sector. So <clears throat> interestingly, the society formed its Greener by Design specialist group more than 20 years ago. Back then, 2050 seemed a long way off, but we're now just 30 years away. And in the UK, facing a legal requirement to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050, compared with the level in 1990, that target is all the more visible. And we've long been highlighting the significance in the society of the non-carbon emissions, such as NOx, nitrogen oxide, and contrails. And we recently drew EASA's attention to our work, particularly on contrails. Increasingly, it's become obvious that technology alone will not come to the rescue regardless of COVID-19, aviation's carbon emissions are set to double by 2050. So we might ask, where is this pathway to true zero for aviation? That is what our learned and distinguished panel are going to tell us this afternoon. And Robert is going to kick off. Over to you, Robert. Right, thank you very much, Brian, for your kind introduction. I don't think I've ever been called learned and distinguished, uh, both adjectives in the same sentence before. So that's uh, extremely flattering, particularly coming from somebody like you, uh, who is, I think, genuinely both learned and distinguished. Uh, as Brian said, we're going to talk this afternoon about our roadmap to true zero which is our roadmap for how the aviation industry can get to a position where it has zero impact on the climate, taking into account both carbon and all of the non-carbon effects, covering NOx, contrails, and aviation-induced cloudiness. I will begin the presentation, and if we go over the page, um, I'll then be handing over to my colleague Nikhil on the right-hand side of this page, Nikhil will talk through some of the technical details behind the presentation. And then finally, Manfred will summarize and conclude the presentation, after which I think we have a set of uh, questions and answers moderated by Brian. So if we go forward from here, I'll start off just by talking about the total radiative forcing impact which aviation has and is projected to have on the climate. And on the first page in this section, we show our forecast that carbon's emissions are set to triple from 2019 to 2050 to reach a total of 3 billion tonnes of CO2. That is um, slightly higher than the figure Brian just gave of doubling 
Um, but I think there's always some uncertainty behind these figures, particularly the long-term industry growth rate and also the rate of advance of conventional technology. And for this, we make relatively middle of the road assumptions for both of those and find that the amount of CO2 we think will triple by 2050. That is despite the impact of COVID-19. And you can see in the yellow lines on this page that our pre-COVID forecast was that the impact of carbon would quadruple by 2050. So we've got a 25% reduction in the impact of carbon due to COVID-19. Um, perhaps not something anybody in the industry would welcome at all. And clearly we need to go a long way forward if we are to get to the true zero target. We then go forward to the next slide. When we talk about true zero, what we mean by that is to include all of the non-CO2 effects. And there is a risk that uh, the non-CO2 climate forcing impacts are much more significant than the CO2 effects as, as a whole. Um, though I would have to say that the science is still developing, very uncertain at this stage, and the error bars are wide. But it could be the case that the when you add together both the CO2 effects and the non-CO2 effects, uh, you increase the total effect by a factor of three. Of that, about 50% uh, of the impact of CO2 comes from NOx, a um, couple of effects within NOx, which uh, maybe Nikhil will talk about in, in more detail. And then the balance comes from either contrails or from aviation-induced cloudiness. And when you add all of those three up, you get to the, the three to one multiplier relative to carbon alone. Then on the next slide, we show the way in which once you stack all of these up, the impact uh, of uh, aviation on the climate could approximately triple by 2050. And this is based on uh, our recovery scenario 3A. Some of you may have seen some of the other COVID-19 uh, uh, webinars which we've been doing. And um, indeed, we did one last week as part of Farnborough Connect, which should be still available on the Farnborough Connect website if people want to have a look at uh, our analysis of COVID-19. But the main message from this is that we think the, the CO2 and non-CO2 effect could approximately triple by 2050. We then go forward to the next slide. Our uh, analysis of the uh, solutions is that there is no silver bullet which will resolve the wider climate impact of aviation. And here we've grouped together the three main technologies, um, sustainable aviation fuels up at the top, electrical propulsion in the middle, and hydrogen down at the bottom. And here we're trying to show both the CO2 impact and the non-CO2 impact, as well as the level of te technological complexity and the commercial challenge. We start off in, in the middle of this, in the battery electric row, part of electrical propulsion, clearly. You can see that battery electric has the potential to have to be the most advantageous in terms of reducing the impact on the climate. Assuming, of course, that um, any electric charge within the batteries comes from renewable sources, and that would eliminate the CO2. And since you're not burning anything or producing any water vapor, there would be no NOx, water vapor, contrails, or aviation-induced cloudiness effect. Up at the top, we have uh, sustainable aviation fuels, where provided the right pathway is chosen, sustainable aviation fuels could, um, in principle, get us to a net zero CO2 impact. There are about five or six different pathways, and some of the power to liquid pathways would allow us, first of all, to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere in order to to generate sustainable aviation fuel. And then when we burn it, exactly the same amount of CO2 goes back into the atmosphere. So the net approach of doing that is zero. 
However, burning um, SAF sustainable fuels would still generate NOx and would also generate water vapor and contrails as well. Slight improvement in terms of uh, the NOx uh, water vapor and contrail effects may come from hybrid electric, whether that's parallel or series, with series arguably slightly better than parallel just because series hybrid would allow us to have a distributed form of propulsion, which is arguably more efficient than um, a more concentrated form of propulsion, which might uh, be the consequence of a parallel hybrid electric. And then finally, down at the bottom of hydrogen, either hydrogen combustion, where we burn hydrogen in a gas turbine, which generates NOx, water vapor, and contrails, or else hydrogen fuel cells, which solve the NOx problem, but still generate a lot of water, water vapor and contrails. So we can see from this, there are a number of different solutions. The only one which is really truly green is battery electric. But of course, battery electric at the moment is extremely limited on range. Um, Pippis Trail have certified their aircraft, their two-seater trainer aircraft, which is uh, battery electric. But uh, the endurance of that aircraft is comparatively short and any commercial application of battery electric aircraft at any scale is very heavily dependent on advances in battery technology which we don't yet see on the horizon we then go forward from here i will hand over to nikhil who will talk about how we can apply these three technologies and other approaches in order to get to a true zero position for the industry. So over to you, Nikhil. Thank you, Robert. So faced with this, with the seemingly very significant challenge in which we have CO2 tripling and indeed non-CO2 effects possibly adding up to another 3x above that, um, the question that we that we asked was, what can the industry do? And what we'd like to propose today is what we're calling the Rollenberger Roadmap to True Zero, which is a five-step plan to get to genuinely zero annual increases in radiative forcing by the year 2050. Walking through this plan, first airlines must continue on the existing path to switch to the latest aircraft. Second, there is a significant investment required into better air traffic control, but also crucially, an investment into what we're calling trajectory optimization, which in essence is air traffic control for contrail minimization. Third, and this is where I think a lot of the attention goes today, the aerospace sector must heavily invest into new revolutionary technologies for flight, but, what we'd like to introduce today is that rather than thinking of these as a one-size-fits-all solution, we should actually apply them for range-specific missions. For less than 1,500 kilometers, we think battery electric aircraft are indeed the best solution as they are true zero solutions with no emissions um, during flight. Going to the other extreme for a moment, for the longest journeys for the largest aircraft, we would recommend deploying sustainable aviation fuels due to gravimetric and volumetric concerns with um, with battery and hydrogen energy storage. It's the middle of the market, which indeed represents the majority of today's emissions. Um, it's the likes of the A320 and Boeing 737 sized aircraft. And we, we would actually over here expect a combination of different solutions with some parts of the world switching to hybrid electric aircraft operated potentially with sustainable aviation fuels and other parts of the world operating hydrogen aircraft. Um, among hydrogen, we would highly recommend hydrogen fuel cell aircraft and, and the reasoning for why will, will appear in the following slides. Now, fourth and indeed in parallel, the sector must keep investing into, into research to continuously improve our understanding of climate science so that we can keep refining our understanding of the problem as well as our strategy for what the solution should be. And fifth, but certainly not least, um, whatever emissions are remaining at the end, they should be compensated for 
uh, to remove any residual, for example, uh, via offsetting. Now, in the following pages, we will quantify the impact of this proposal and address each of the revolutionary technologies in turn. So starting off, we have our 2050 challenge, um, as, as Robert had, um, had just laid out a few minutes ago. Uh, about a third of that is CO2, about a sixth is, is in NOx, and broadly the remainder is in contrails and aviation-induced cloudiness. So let's address our very first lever. Ongoing airline efficiency improvements, as well as air traffic control improvements. Now these are fuel burn reduction measures. So they do in, in fact have an equal effect in all radiative forces as they simply reduce the amount of liters of fuel burnt. Airline efficiency improvements include measures such as aircraft weight reduction, best crew speed adherence, etc. And these are measures that a lot of airlines um, are already very familiar with, but in many cases um, do have challenges in implementing due to operational concerns. However, we do think that there's a fair amount to be found here in terms of improvement. Air traffic control is also very impactful. For example, in Europe, by reducing barriers between different jurisdictions to allow more direct flying, such as through measures such as single European skies. Now, these are not easy improvements. Nevertheless, we do believe that together they could be worth around 10%. Now, the next lever is a very important one. Um, as introduced just a moment ago, um, we do believe fundamentally that Next generation aircraft available today, such as A320neos, Boeing 737 Maxes, Boeing 787s, A350s, these are very uh, effective at reducing not just CO2, but as you can see in the bar chart on the right hand side, actually providing significant reductions in, in other radiative forces as well. The reason for this is that even though the majority of aircraft flying today are mid generation aircraft, there are actually a very large share of classic generation aircraft, such as B737 classics, all B767s, B757s flying around. Um, for example, in the US alone, the share of classics um, flying are, is around 35%. Replacing these with the latest technology is very impactful, reducing fuel burn by 15% or more, NOx by 30% or more, and actually soot by 80% or more. The knock-on impact of that such reduction goes directly to contrail and aviation-induced cloudiness production, re re resulting in the expected uh, changes here. While we obviously understand that airlines are today in dire straits, the aviation sector is certainly expected to recover in due course, and airlines, we believe, should endeavor to transition to the best-in-class aircraft as soon as possible with a net impact worth around 25% by the year 2050. The next major lever is what we call trajectory optimization. Now, this considers redirection of flights to optimize flight profiles and minimize contrail and aviation-induced cloudiness formation. Now, critically, no major aircraft or engine technology changes are actually required to achieve this. This is more of an aircraft redirection scheme, but it can be worth as much as 15%, mainly in contrail and AIC reduction. So thus far, 10, 25, and 15, we're, we're adding up to around 50% in net radiative forcing reduction by the year 2050, even before the introduction of revolutionary aircraft technologies. But any further reduction beyond this point by the year 2050 would require um, new revolutionary aircraft. So let's apply our very first range-specific new aircraft technology, which is battery electric, up to 1,500 kilometers. Battery electric reduces fuel burn directly. And assuming batteries, as Robert mentioned, are charged with renewable energy, this would completely remove um, all emissions during operation. This, is impact, this impact is valued at approximately 15%. In the next range category, we assume a mix of technologies, about half hybrid and half hydrogen aircraft. We estimate that, hy that hybrids will continue burning kerosene, but that it will be e-kerosene. So that's a form of sustainable aviation fuel, which can be produced using green energy. And we, we do assume indeed that pathways for sustainable aviation fuels will be built to allow 100% um, SAF usage in, in 
in these future hybrid aircraft. Hydrogen fuel cell aircraft will also be used for the, for the remainder of 50% of the flights, um, decarbonizing completely, but also removing some NOx effects. And while they may increase water vapor emissions, um, they, they do somewhat, they can somewhat reduce the overall impact um, even despite trajectory optimization and, abs and absolutely in addition to trajectory optimization. The impact here is about 15%. For the final range category, we have the largest aircraft performing the longest haul journeys. And really the only viable solution that we see by the year 2050 here is most likely to be sustainable aviation fuels. These can decarbonize completely, albeit only on a net basis but they do have a somewhat beneficial reduction in other effects as well with a net impact of around 10 percent we are then left with approximately 10 percent of our starting point so we have been able to remove around 90 percent of our 2050 target um, in radiative forcing terms we have completely decarbonized so there's no carbon left at this point but we still have some knocks and contrails and aviation induced cloudiness effects still to deal with, mainly due to the ongoing usage of sustainable aviation fuels in the long haul category and hydrogen in the narrow body category. We would recommend that these emissions are compensated in other ways, such as using offsetting. In the next few slides, um, I will breeze through some of the specifics around these revolutionary technologies, the four highlighted here, um, and certainly we can return to them in more detail as part of the Q&A. So, First, in, in breezing through, let's tackle trajectory optimization. I think the key message that we'd like to deliver here is that there is indeed potential to act now. There has been a handful of studies, um, one in Japan, one in Europe, one in the US, which have looked at this in detail and suggest that route optimization as well as altitude optimization can produce anywhere between a 50 and 80% reduction in contrail formation. Now, contrails lead on to aviation-induced cloudiness. So when, when we consider trajectory optimization, it is really uh, addressing about half of today's uh, radiative forcing impact that aviation creates. Now, this reduction in, in contrails and AIC is not free. It comes at the cost of increased fuel burn because of flights being redirected. However, the studies thus far have indicated that the, that the so-called cost of doing so is as little as 0 to 2%. There's two types of contrail, um, of contrail reduction in the trajectory optimization available, route and altitude. Route optimization is very difficult, requiring accurate knowledge of atmospheric data and identification of high contrail formation regions in advance and possibly quite, and quite possibly during the flight itself. However, altitude optimization is somewhat easier by requiring that aircraft fly within the troposphere and do not enter the stratosphere where water vapor emissions are particularly harmful and contrail formation is much more likely. However, this does come with the challenge that aircraft would need to be packed in a smaller uh, and more restricted airspace um, if the stratosphere is off limits. Now, despite the increased fuel burn, this lever should be considered as low hanging fruit. And we recommend that the industry researches this lever further and as soon as possible applies at least altitude optimization, which is a relatively simple aspect of application and then in the medium term, adapts air traffic control to operate full trajectory optimization, capturing the full benefit that is available that indeed further research is still required to show um, the extent of. Next, moving on to battery electric aircraft, we see that um, sub-regional and regional aircraft could potentially um, be addressable by, by this technology. Now, this does take into account relatively bullish assumptions on battery densities. However, it does come down to airframe architectural improvements as well. So we would need airframes at this relatively smaller aircraft category to leverage distributed propulsion. And if so, battery electric could be feasible up to the 1500 kilometer range. Battery electric and uh, battery uh, technology should thus be a priority area for, for aerospace to focus on. Uh, thus far, we have benefited from the automotive industry investing into this area. However, uh, we, are, we are getting to the point that 
from an automotive perspective, gravimetric densities are already good enough. Indeed, they're more concerned about volumetric densities. It is the gravimetric side that we are more concerned with in, in the aerospace sector. And at some point, the aerospace sector will have to will have to pick up the baton from the automotive sector um, to continue uh, the improvements that we would need for these kinds of aircraft to be uh, addressable. Looking at hybrids next, um, considering the larger narrow body scale, we do not expect battery electric to be a viable solution. However, various types of hybrid could be applicable. Now, parallel hybrid is a good technology offering up to 25, up to 20% reduction in radiative forcing. But if, in, if we consider 100% sustainable aviation fuel utilization, once again, assuming that they're produced with green hydrogen only, um, uh, uh, with green hydrogen only and, and indeed green electricity only, we could see RF reductions along with SAFs of up to 60% with parallel hybrid. Series hybrid, as Robert mentioned, leveraging distributed propulsion um, are also a very effective technology with RF reductions without SAFs already up to 65%, assuming that we can get some additional control optimization during flight through optimized battery or turboelectric generator usage. Now with sustainable aviation fuels, making those assumptions, it could be worth up to 90% reduction in radiative forcing terms. So airframers really have to take distributed propulsion very seriously as the impact here can be very significant indeed, not only with hybrids as on this slide, but indeed also considering the benefits um, in the less than 1500 kilometer category, as we just saw on the previous slide. The inclusion of SAFs is also indeed very impactful and any hybrid electric aircraft we would recommend consider engines which are designed to be 100% SAF compatible, as we heard, in a number of presentations during FIA Connect last week. This is indeed a major challenge, but very good positive strides are being made in this direction already. Considering the other half of the narrow body scale aircraft, let's look at hydrogen. We have considered hydrogen fuel cells to be deployed here, not combustion, as our goal is to completely remove all radiative forcing effects as part of the roadmap to true zero. So while hydrogen combustion is indeed great for decarbonization, our estimates as per these waterfalls actually suggest that it could make contrails and AIC much worse and potentially increase radiative forcing on a net basis. We thus consider hydrogen fuel cells only in this category. And within this, we notice that trajectory optimization is absolutely critical to their operation. Without trajectory optimization, we see contrails and AIC going up and actually negating any benefit in total radiative forcing terms. With assumed trajectory optimization, making similar assumptions as we saw on previous slides, and in, indeed with very careful operation, the impact can reduce by around 55%. There's a number of challenges to overcome for hydrogen, not least of which is understanding the exact climate impact of combustion versus fuel cells with and without trajectory optimization. But there are indeed a number of other challenges as well, such as hydrogen storage, which has volumetric density constraints at the moment, as well as production, indeed, of, of green hydrogen at scale. Last but not least, we should look at sustainable aviation fuels also, which, as we mentioned earlier, is for the longest haul aircraft, uh, for the largest, uh, is for the largest aircraft doing the longest haul journeys. Now, on a net basis, as it as it indicates, SAFs can decarbonize completely, assuming engines. Um, are capable of, of using 100% SAFs. They also produce a notable reduction in NOx as well as other effects um, because of their, their comparative purity uh, compared with uh, more naturally occurring uh, hydrocarbons. Among the many different types of SAFs available, we considered um, various elements of sustainability. So not just the net carbon and indeed non-carbon emissions in, in utilization, but also the usage of arable land, water, as well as feedstock availability for production. Power to liquid SAFs emerge in our Rollenberger sustainability score as easily the most, um, most sustainable among sustainable aviation fuels. And by 2030, we actually firmly think uh, based on, uh, on, on, on available public data, 
uh, in terms of how these fuels are expected to ramp up in production, that they could become absolutely cost competitive um, in the next 10 years. So net of all of these different levers, where does it leave us? We first start off with the line that indeed goes up all the way until 2050, uh, which is very similar to, to what we saw in, in earlier slides, uh, which is really a tripling in carbon and then another tripling in non-CO2 effects. However, through careful implementation of all of these different measures, we can reduce the net impact to around 10% of where we would have been by 2050. In addition, it's interesting to note that partially due to the COVID effect, the peak of the blue um, part of the chart here, which is our residual emissions, can be broadly held at 2019 levels. It does a peak around 2035 when we assume novel revolutionary technologies can start filtering in uh, and penetrating the market. However, it is really important to note that around 50% of this impact can actually come from existing technologies through airlines transitioning to A320neos, transitioning to, to Boeing 787s, A350s, and other next generation aircraft. We can already see a very significant reduction in total radiative forcing by 2050. However, as you will notice that even after we implement airline efficiency and air traffic control improvements, transitions to the next generation aircraft and the need to trajectory optimization. So all the, let's say, evolutionary improvements, the curve will continue tending upwards post 2050. So if we want to see any long-term reductions um, in radiative forcing terms, we do need to invest in, um, in hydrogen, in electrification, as well as in sustainable aviation fuels. So with that, I would like to now hand over to Manfred to close off. Thank you, Nikhil, and thank you, Robert, and thank you, Nikhil, especially for this technological uh, deep dive. Um, let's uh, move on to the next slide, please. So um, there really is some uh, bad news out there. Let's call it a challenge. And uh, that challenge is that uh, the carbon emission uh, of aviation is going to triple um, until 2050. And that's not all. What's actually even worse is that the overall radio forcing, uh, which is about three times the carbon emission, is also going to uh, go up that rate, uh, which will make uh, aviation one of the premier climate killers. Yeah. Um, the good news or the silver lining on the horizon is um, there can be a clear roadmap to do away with that issue and uh, actually effectively safeguard uh, aviation or the position of aviation uh, in our society. Uh, I think uh, Nikhil uh, has shown us uh, uh, how such a roadmap could look like. Uh, we believe the timing is absolute right. Uh, if you look at, uh, at what is happening, for example, at the at European level, uh, where a lot of talk and uh, also starting action uh, turns around the Green Deal, uh, where we're currently seeing uh, a lot of um, uh, these green ideas being implemented uh, within uh, COVID-19 uh, rescue packages. Uh, the timing is clearly right, uh, but it will require two things. Uh, um, firstly, um, there is no technological silver bullet, uh, um, as, as Robert has explained already. Um, with regards to industry, uh, you will have to do research uh, in different directions uh, and not necessarily put all your eggs into one basket. So it requires a differentiated technology roadmap. And um, as a lot of actions um, are not only pertaining to industry or manufacturing industry, but also to airports, aviation um, or air traffic control, for example, a lot of concerted action across the industry, uh, including government, will be required. Uh, but the clear message from our side, um, uh, a roadmap, uh, a very convincing roadmap can be structured and it's now up to implementing this one, basically uh, not only on the industry side, also, but also of course industry side um, and the other relevant stakeholders. Handing over to you now, uh, Brian, for question and answers. Thank you.
<laughs> and thank you for a, a very interesting presentation. It's um, not often that you see the entire roadmap laid out in, um, in one go, as it were. Um, <clears throat> inevitably, that's inspired a lot of questions. Um, so I'll um, kick off um, <clears throat> with one that is um, quite common, but actually Paul Briggs from Bird and Bird uh, raised it. And over the turn of last year into this, we saw a range of reports on aviation's impact on climate change. On the one hand, the most draconian was one called net zero. It's posited that there was no solution to aviation and decarbonisation. Therefore, we'd all have to stop flying. Um, in the middle was the UK's Committee on Climate Change and perhaps the most optimistic, as you might expect, um, synthetic aviation, uh, sorry, Sustainable Aviation UK's report. Now, each of them um, sort of anchored themselves around the growth of passenger numbers that could be sustained. And um, in that way, Committee of Climate Change was in the middle and um, synthetic aviation was obviously the most um, optimistic. So, uh, and they talk about this significant growth that can be achieved in passenger numbers whilst achieving near zero emissions. Is that actually a deliverable solution or is it actually a bit of a PR exercise? Could it be regarded as greenwashing? In other words, um, is it, in your view, back with a sort of analysis you put in front of us this afternoon? Robert is smiling, so he's obviously expecting the question. say that that's a typical Paul Briggs sort of question and uh, exactly what I would have expected from Paul about uh, talking about greenwashing. Um, we think that there is a route for aviation to grow in a way which doesn't dam damage the climate, which is how we set it out today. Uh, we don't think it's a straightforward route or a simple route, but there are clearly different set of steps which the industry can take in order to reduce its impact on the climate and continue to grow. Um, as I said at the beginning, our pre-COVID-19 forecasts from about this time last year saw aviation's carbon emissions quadruple between now and 2050. Um, as a result of what's happened this year, we see them only tripling, so growing slightly slower than pre-COVID-19 forecast. But we certainly see a route forward. And as I said, it's not easy. If I think of just the air traffic control improvements, this has been talked about for years and years about how we could just improve air traffic control, um, stop all of the circling over Heathrow on a, on a Friday night and all those sorts of things and cut fuel burn. And yet the steps to implement it are immensely or seem to be immensely co complicated and political. And, no doubt not helped by Brexit either. Um, you know, another reason that Brexit is a complete nonsense. So um, we do think there's a way forward and I don't think it's greenwashing at all, but it's by no means a straightforward, um, straightforward thing to implement. Uh, just a reminder to all our attendees, please keep the questions coming. I'm going to move on one uh, from um, from Simon Fippard, um, another corporate partner, and it's for Nikhil. Um, and I've got a rather broader wraparound of this question because it's fascinating. It's about synthetic aviation fuels. And um, what Simon is interested to know is, um, can SAFs decarbonize completely on a net basis? Because is this including the cost of production and distribution and after allowance for, say, things like deforestation, etc.? And the reason um, we find this interesting is because in about November last year, Imperial College and a German institute whose name escapes me produced a report on the economics of the infrastructure for uh, synthetic aviation fuel. And they posited that to provide the volumes required across European airlines would take an investment of, and wait for it, 400 
billion euro plus or minus 140 billion. It was that uncertain. But the interesting thing is, if you're going to invest capital and at that level, it's got to be sustainable in the long term. But actually, hydrogen is going to replace SAF, um, as your roadmap shows. So uh, where do we sit on that? What is, what is the total business model around SAF, Mikel? Thanks very much. Um, so I think this actually gets at a question that we were asking ourselves as well a bit earlier this year. What we, what we noticed was a lot of discussion around SAFs um, with an underlying assumption that broadly, you know, they're all, it's all one, one type of fuel that is, that is the same. The reality is that there's five different pathways to produce SAFs and another two that were actually um, made available in 2020. So there's actually seven pathways to produce SAFs. And in addition to the seven pathways, there's a plethora of different feedstocks each of which in combination actually creates a very different footprint on the environment. So for example, you can have the Velocis BA or IAG, I should say, option, which is a waste to fuel um, a sustainable aviation fuel, which uses the HEFA pathway. Um, and that is actually one of the most cost-effective today. It is, it has a medium high sustainability footprint. Um, and it is, it is rather good. Um, there are some somewhat less effective SAFs. For example, if we, if we, if we look at uh, those which use soybeans um, or, uh, or corn, which ultimately require a competition almost with, with arable land. Um, and in a world in which by, again, by 2050, we are likely to have a significant food crisis, that's not the kind of competition we're looking for. So net of all of these effects, our analysis suggests that if we if we're trying to identify the most sustainable sustainable aviation fuel, it's actually power to liquid fuels. Power to liquid fuels, in essence, make um, make e kerosene out of um, carbon that can be sucked out of the air in a very expensive way. It's not cheap at all today. It's direct air carbon capture, or it could indeed be carbon capture from let's say coal power stations in combination with water that is uh, that is then electrolyzed to produce hydrogen. So what we're really doing in producing e-kerosene is we're producing hydrogen as a, as a stepping stone, mixing it with carbon from the air, and that gives us that gives us e-kerosene. And that is incredibly expensive to produce. So in our estimate today, relative to today's incredibly reduced depressed fuel prices, the cost of these kinds of fuels is anywhere up to anywhere between eight to 16 times the cost of of regular kerosene available in the market today that does not make for a very compelling business case and uh, indeed the volume of SAF production today is about 0.01 percent of total global aviation fuel usage having said that especially because of investments in europe especially in scandinavia there's a rapid scale up going on, um, including with projects that, uh, such as the one mentioned with IAG and Shell. And expectations remain that we could be looking at up to 2% production by 2025. Now, if that comes, comes to pass, that's 2% more than electric aircraft. That's 2% more than hydrogen aircraft by 2025. So we do think it's a very good pathway to follow and it must be followed. And just like any other thing, if it is scaled up, production costs will come down and the business case will improve. So while we have not independently calculated the total investment required, and I can't, I can't comment on whether the hundreds of billions um, suggested in your, in your question are correct or not, um, I, I definitely think it will be expensive, but it is really the only way to decarbonize if we still want to fly to Singapore uh, in, in, a, in a sustainable aircraft one day. Uh, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> um, I've got one coming up on electrification. Um, but after that, um, just so you can all think about this, um, we want to move on to the business models. And this point about 35% of um, classics in, um, in airline uh, ownership currently and um, what the significance is of replacing those. So you may want to think about that. But the one on electrification is. Um, uh, perhaps the classic that the automotive industry is used to in that um, electric batteries are regarded 
and their manufacturers re are regarded as harmful to the environment. So um, are we actually gaining if we use them in a holistic sense? Are we gaining if we use them in aviation? Perhaps um, a supplementary issue you might want to comment on is, um, well, what is the security of supply of lithium ion batteries? And is lithium ion the only place we're going to go? Or is there some new chemistry out there? But you know, what about this end-to-end -end process for production of uh, uh, lithium batteries? Do you want to have a go at that, Robert? Um, I think you're muted. Right, yeah, yeah, certainly. I mean, there are, you're right, there are certainly challenges around the environmental sustainability of lithium ion batteries, for instance. And one of those is the fact that a typical lithium ion battery may only be good for at most a thousand charge cycles before you have to replace it. So if you're a, a short haul airline operating, let's say six sectors per day, yeah, after six months, your battery needs to be replaced. And, and so through the life of, I don't know, 30 year lifetime of an aircraft, you might go through 50 or 60 battery replacement cycles. Uh, and that again puts another sustainability burden on, on the industry. So um, that's why I think if battery electric aircraft are really going to um, gain acceptance, there may be different chemistries required to lithium iron, particularly given the uh, weight constraints as well. But, um, the moment um, I think batteries uh, at a battery level density uh, are something like two to three hundred watt hours per kilo. There is a, a magical figure of about 500 watt hours per kilo that people talk about as being the, the figure at which battery electric aircraft start to become a, a plausible contender. But even at that level, um, batteries are a factor of 12 or 13 less good than kerosene in terms of um, energy content per unit of weight. So if battery electric aircraft are to get going, I think that there are new and different battery chemistries which are required. And then hopefully some of those will be uh, less dangerous to the environment uh, or place less of a burden on the environment than a, a lithium ion source. So um, yeah, still some way to go on batteries, which is why um, when we put together this roadmap, we were trying to be clear that there is no one silver bullet that solves all of the environmental problems of aviation. And battery electric has its, its role to play, but only for comparatively short sectors, and therefore by no means at a large proportion of the fleet. And it, it is part of the solution, but not the only solution. And, and just to be clear, um, what assumption does your net zero roadmap take about passenger growth between now and 2050? Um, overall, in this scenario, we assume about a 4% per annum growth rate uh, once we get back to a stable position. So we assume that we, we see the current dip in air traffic, that by about 2023 or 24, we get back to 2019 levels of air traffic. And then from there, we grow at 4% per annum which is about half a percent uh, slower than we saw before the before the current crisis. Yeah, I recognize that. Now, we're into some free consultancy now. Um, one of you is representing an airline, one of you is representing an OEM, and one of you is, in, um, is um, representing an investment bank. And you can choose which one you are, but the first one to speak obviously gets the choice. But here's the situation. You've pointed out that a 35% um, amongst fleets of classic airplanes. So um, as an OEM, and uh, you will have seen interviews by both the CEO of uh, Boeing and Airbus recently, my strategy is to encourage those airlines to replace those airplanes. But what does that mean to the uh, business model I've created around, um, firstly, my ability to produce the airplanes required and be the aftermarket assumptions I've made as an OEM. Um, as an airline, um, what is where, what am I looking for here in the balance of the way I descale the number of classics and replace them? 
And um, am I looking at like for like? Can I assume that um, regional short haul is going to recover first? So I'd be uh, looking more to my um, um, single aisle airplanes. And if I'm an investor, what does that do to my assumptions about the risk of, um, of financing airlines, which is one of the um, most esoteric types of risk I know? So who wants to speak for the OEM first? <laughs> yeah. Let me try to give a stab at the OEM then. Yeah. Um, I mean, we are talking COVID right now. Yeah? And uh, honestly speaking, out there, nobody really needs an aircraft in the next two years. Yeah? So um, what we're doing is trying to find ways around uh, and make sure that the production system is surviving. And I think that's something which has a top priority right now. Yeah? This explains uh, why Airbus, for example, is continuing to, uh, to build uh, A320s at a rate 40. And they will be parking them on some parking lots in, uh, in southern France and northern Germany. Yeah? Um, and they have struck some kind of deals uh, with their customers who have uh, contracts with Airbus, that's clear, but who have no ability whatsoever in, in the short term uh, to take delivery of aircraft. Yeah? So we're trying to muddle through on this one here. And uh, uh, it all really depends on, 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 I would say, the reserves that Airbus has, which are not too bad. Yeah? Um, but that certainly is also um, some, um, some, some support required from the outside. I mean, you have seen, uh, uh, you have seen in France, for example, that the government is asking um, uh, airlines like Air France to get rid of uh, of all the aircraft or to stop uh, uh, serving um, uh, to stop serving. Um, uh, routes uh, where trains can also fly. Yeah. Um, so this will not work exactly without uh, um, support from the government, be it uh, uh, direct, which is less probable, or indirect uh, towards the airline, encouraging them to actually change over um, their fleet. Yeah. But uh, honestly speaking, the situation as such is nobody needs an aircraft in the next two years, and everything else is finding ways around. And I believe that will kind of condition also the answer of the two other stakeholders. Sure, but uh, I mean, of course, where you are in the life cycle of that airplane as the OEM uh, determines how much of the non-recurring cost you've already recovered and how much you haven't, and that you're placing at risk. So, who's going to speak for the airline? I think Nikhil should speak for the airline, and then I'll go last as the banker because the the bankers always get paid the most. So I'll pick that position. <laughs> okay. Nikhil, what would you say to us? Yeah, absolutely. So I think I think there's three considerations here. Uh, the first one is what type of airline am I? There are certain types of airlines that would greatly benefit from a package like this. There are a number of airlines out there which shall remain nameless, uh, but you know certainly quite a lot of them in, in the US uh, that have a very old fleet, uh, for example, and they are indeed operating those classic generation um, aircraft. Uh, and from an environmental perspective, those, be, those would be the ones that a, such a scheme should be targeting. So for them, it's actually a great scheme. They get a cash infusion. And to be frank, they're probably not flying those aircraft in the first place. And um, I think, you know, for, from, from an airline's perspective, if you're able to get a cash infusion for, in essence, to be, to be, slightly, to be slightly pushy, doing something that you may have done anyway, well, then that's fantastic. However, there is another type of airline which uh, typically falls more into the, let's say, the, the category of, of airlines which are uh, low-cost airlines, low-cost carriers that might be operating a much younger fleet by definition as part of their business model. They might already be switching to the latest generation of aircraft, and they probably wouldn't be able to benefit from this kind of scheme. So the first, so the first consideration as, as an airline is, who, you know, what kind of airline am I? The second piece to think about is um, additionality. So a number of A380s, for example, have already been retired. A number of 747s have already been retired. And, and a lot of the, the 767s and 75s, the really old aircraft out there, um, have, have already been, airlines have already made statements saying that they will not be returning back to service. So in the design of such a scheme, we have to be very careful in, in ensuring that it is indeed additional. 
um, that we're not indeed as a as as an airline. You know, I'd be very happy to benefit from the cash infusion for doing something that I would have done, but but ultimately uh, governments will have to ensure that they don't necessarily uh, fall into that trap. And the final consideration, which I think is very important, um, is what is really the purpose of a scheme like this? Is it really a green in, um, in infusion uh, for, for, for sustainability purposes? Um, or is it actually more of a stimulus for the aerospace sector? Um, or is it a stimulus indeed for the aviation sector? If it is a green stimulus first and foremost, then as an airline or indeed as, a, as, as, as the funder, as the government, I would be most interested in the cost of carbon abatement and ensuring that whatever um, cost there is indeed of that of that reduction that I'm, I'm achieving by switching these, these aircraft out, uh, there isn't a better business case in, in doing something else, such as, for example, managing um, APD in the UK, as we would say, um, and, and incentivizing airlines that have better aircraft uh, versus airlines that may not have um, as good aircraft through other means. Okay, and uh, a quick answer um, to advise um, the investment banker or the aircraft lesser. So there's going to be a perturbation in our assumptions of the useful life projection of these fleets of airplanes. So um, how's that going to work then, Robert? Mm. I would say it, if I had an investment in an aircraft lessor at the moment, I would probably be quite worried, um, not only because of the COVID-19 impact, but if um, our route, uh, route roadmap to true zero comes to pass, then we do need to roll over the entire fleet at least once, if not twice, between now and 2050. Uh, and that will um, not be at all good for residual values. Um, and hence the um, leasing rates, which the lessors are currently charging, are going to be significantly understated compared to what will be needed for them to, to, to make money. So I think uh, it's a tough time for aircraft lessors. And then if I have investments into well, either aircraft OEMs or, or systems and engine companies, that has different implications for each of those. Um, uh, I, I would say for the OEMs, uh, Manfred has covered that uh, quite a lot for the aircraft OEMs. Engines and systems companies, they have to invest in all of the new technology which will be required in order to bring these new technologies to, to market. So very heavy R&D bills to come for, for all of those, probably or almost certainly requiring some form of government support in order to make the business cases positive. So quite a, a difficult time for investment, particularly with growth at a slightly lower rate than um, we've seen historically, and therefore harder to close the business case and make it positive than would otherwise have been the case. So, um, okay. difficult Thank sector you. to invest in at the moment. Um, we Time is against us, so uh, final question, but a quick answer maybe from just one of you. No, one, one, just one sentence from each of you. Um, the whole business of um, trajectory optimization has been circulating around in our sort of specialist areas for a long time, but uh, we found it impossible almost to get any traction with governments or regulators on it. But what one thing would each of you recommend we do as an aviation and aerospace community to get the attention of regulators and governments? If you allow me to go first, uh, I would actually uh, uh, sketch out leaky roadmap uh, and draw the attention to it's not only about carbon. Uh, we have a solution, so please hear us. Uh, the topic is it's not high enough on the on the on, on the priorities list, and it needs to uh, be bumped up. Uh, so I would go on the offensive. Perhaps I can go second, and Robert, you can have the last word. Um, for me, I would definitely invest in better science. Um, we don't fully understand these effects because, to be fair, the science has not really uh, received enough attention um, in terms of what is really the impact of, of these non-CO2 effects. What is really the impact of, of trajectory optimization? Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a scatter, uh, it's a scattered few studies at the moment, and we do need to improve our collective understanding um, to be able to then quantify the impact and improve the business cases and really demonstrate the impact uh, overall. And then finally, I would just link it through to hydrogen. There seems to be an awful lot of excitement in hydrogen at the moment. The 
hype around hydrogen, which we don't necessarily believe um, is the case. But uh, as a result of the hype, there seems to be a lot of money going into hydrogen. So if we could uh, piggyback on the, on the back of some of that uh, cash, perhaps we can get some funding to look into um, contrails and aviation-induced cloudiness. OK, thank you very much. And um, taken together, a, a fascinating session, I have to say. Uh, it's not often that you see the holistic approach to all these factors mapped out in quite this way. And frankly, um, that's what it's going to take to bring people on side with both investment, political capital, and the sheer will to change things. And if they can see the incremental improvements that will result, then uh, we stand a chance of getting the argument across. What we can't do is sit on our hands in the aviation and aerospace ecosystem and think it's all going to be all right by 2050 because as you pointed out very lucidly it won't be and technology alone is not the answer so thanks to all of you for that thank you for the time you've taken putting in uh, to creating that presentation which i'm sure will be studied widely um, in the weeks to come and this will appear um, this webinar recording will appear uh, on our youtube channel in due course with your agreement um just to flag up the next one uh, august is coming and we uh, don't normally run a corporate partner brief in august so immediately at the front of september on the second we have david oxley for, who is director of business growth at highland and islands enterprise otherwise known as the managing director of the scottish spaceport who will take us through the um the agony and ecstasy of uh, getting full planning consent as they now have for the vertical launch Scottish spaceport. Um, and we're currently working up our autumn program uh, for the remainder of the year, uh, which uh, our best prediction is that they will be delivered as webinars, but we remain to see. And uh, beyond that, of course, we do offer a, a wide variety of events. So please keep your eye on the events calendar for those opportunities. Meantime, this is the end of this webinar. They always end in an abrupt stop. So in accordance with protocol, we will all wave you goodbye and thank you for attending. And thanks to our panel. And soon the screen will go blank.